Hello at home. I'm Leandra Zarno, author of Battling Bella, the protest politics of Bella Abzug. Thank you to Houston Public Library for this opportunity to field your questions. I'm honored to be April's pick of the year long suffrage centennial book club. As one of the coordinators of this initiative, I encourage you all to participate and stay tuned to virtual activities throughout 2020. Just Google Suffrage Centennial Book Club for the full list and spread the word using hashtag SCBC. For more on Battling Bella, check out my website leandrazarno.com or follow me on Twitter at lzarno, spelled Z-A-R-N-O-W, and please spread the word using hashtag Battling Bella. Now to your thoughtful questions. As I teach at the University of Houston, I'll open with these two. One comes from Alex of Houston, Texas, and she asks, while researching and writing, what was the most interesting or surprising thing you learned about Bella Abzug? Also, Taylor of Washington, D.C. asks, can you talk about the importance and meaning of the 1977 National Women's Conference to the participants as well as the greater public? Well, recently, Gloria Steinem said that the National Women's Conference that took place in Houston in, in November of 1977 was the most important event that nobody knows about. I believe it because in the early 2000s, I stumbled across a book in the library that was titled What Women Want. I was intrigued. I picked it up and I discovered the National Women's Conference within its fold for the first time. I became enthralled by the details of this conference. How could I not have heard about it? Uh, it wasn't really part of the distant past, um, but you know, I was a 20 something and it was news to me. So initially I set out to write about the National Women's Conference, but quickly became interested in the women behind it. Bella Abzug was easily the most recognizable woman in politics in the 1970s, and that was a decade the United Nations called the Decade of Women. And this had been, you know, just three decades later, in the early 2000s, and the National Women's Conference had already been largely forgotten. Since then, I've been among the historians working diligently around the country to resurrect public attention to the National Women's Conference and also to its presiding officer, and really the lady behind the idea the National Women's Con of the National Women's Conference, and that is Bella Abzug. So first, why is the National Women's Conference important? There's many reasons, but I'll give you three. One is it was the most diverse and only federally funded gathering of American women of its kind in US history. The law that was largely drafted by Bella Abzug and her friend, Representative Patsy Takemoto Mink of Hawaii, um, but also included a lot of other women in Congress and some male allies too, was unique because not only did it appropriate $5 million for this conference, it also included a diversity requirement. And this diversity requirement ensured that women and some men would be elected as delegates, 2,000 delegates in fact, that would actually reflect the nation's diversity. So it was very obvious when the television camera started to zoom in on the conference um, proceedings that this was a much more representative body than the, as Bella Abzug would call it, unrepresentativeness of the U.S. Congress. And for thousands in the convention hall who participated in and observed the passing of the National Plan of Action, addressing issues from disability to rural women and foreign affairs to lesbian rights, it was an I was there moment, a moment making history, really ahead of the curve in some issues, um, you know, and really trying to pave the way forward for uh, the national agenda in the United States in 1977. But, and here is point two, the National Women's Caucus, uh, sorry, conference was a galvanizing moment that helped launch careers of notable politicians from Ann Richards to Sylvia Garcia to Maxine Waters. It was a meeting point for women artists, indigenous women, poor women, women of color. In fact, even some credit this event as a place where that term was coined. Still, Many aspects of the policy agenda outlined as the Nas National Women's Conference at the National Women's Conference really remains unfinished. And in fact, Bella Abzug was so strong in pushing this agenda as a member of President Jimmy Carter's National Advisory Committee for Women, she was in fact fired when she pressed him, particularly as did other commissioners on this committee, um, to put forward the agenda more than he was was uh, comfortable with. 
and his administration was comfortable with. So she was fired in 1979. So I believe one of the reasons that led to the Women's March of 2017 was the built up frustration and disappointment, but also renewed expectation um, 40 years later to return to an agenda such as that which was established at the National Women's Conference. For Bella Abzug, the National Women's Conference was her boldest, her wildest democratic experiment imagined. And she really found it um, difficult to uh, recognize and to um, take, in, take to heart the fact that the Spirit of Houston report that was delivered to Carter in 1978 um, was not going to move from the idea stage to action. Um, and so this was one of her great, greatest disappointments. Which brings me to my third point on the National Women's Conference and a response to a question posed by Joe of Houston, Texas, which was, what do you think Bella Abzug would think about our current political climate, particularly the frequently discussed polarization? Well, I believe Bella Abzug would have reminded us that in the 1970s, these were no less polarized uh, times. Uh, remember, this is you know a moment that we are um, in the middle of the Vietnam War, that there's incredible oil shocks, uh, that there's incredible urban unrest. Um, and there was a lot of internal um, you know, party uh, friction within both the Democratic and the, and the um, Republican parties. And I think what's important to think about is that the partisan alignment that we have today was less rigid then, for it was possible to be a Republican feminist and a pro-life Democrat. Equally so, the National Women's Conference is an important reminder of women's ideological diversity. For the other side of feminist victories from Roe v. Wade to the National Women's Conference appropriation was a resistance force organized to defend family values. Bella Abzug both downplayed the savviness of conservative women uh, working at the grassroots just as she aimed to replicate their example or at least match it. One of the surprising finds I had during the, my research project, um, what, really for researching this book, was a bunch of discarded yellow notepads, um, yellow legal pads that Abzug would jot down her ideas in the 1960s. And some of these scribbles reflect, um, in some of these scribbles, she really reflected on the power of the Goldwater Coalition of 1964 as these ladies, or they were called Goldwater girls, um, you know, uh, behind it uh, were, were really, um, you know, as, as Abzug saw it, very, very powerful. She urged progressive women to learn from the Goldwater Girls example, from their letter writing and their lobbying, and to match that enthusiasm and skill. She believed that there needed to be a progressive women's force on the left at the same level as on the right as she saw it in 1964. So by 1977, she faced and she really expected that some of these were, um, you know, the same women. Uh, so, for instance, she would come to Houston and she had to swim through a stream of protesters holding signs saying, Bella, go home. So she expected that some of these um, were the same women that she had matched, uh, you know, over a decade earlier. And Texas really was a major center of um, this kind of activism. So, for instance, we know more about uh, Phyllis Schlafly than we do Lottie Beth Hobbs who led the group Women Who Want to Be Women and came up with the idea of hosting a pro-life conference at the Houston Astrodome at the same time as the National Women's Conference. So Abzug, Bella Abzug really discounted the ideology of conservative women, seeing them as duped beneficiaries of a vast patriarchal system, but she did not discount their skill as political organizers. And so I want to return um, to Bella Abzug before the National Women's Conference now. Uh, once I realized that she was at the helm of this incredible event, I was curious to learn everything I could about her. Um, so I began, began this journey, as I said, in, um, you know, in the early 20s, and I've really been on this journey of discovery about Bella Abzug ever since. And I found that before Bella Abzug ran for Congress in 1970 at 50 years old, she had um, a 25-year uh, career she really had made her name for herself as a lawyer uh, who defended workers, racial minorities, political dissenters um, at the height of the McCarthy period. So the first chapter of Battling Bella provides a snapshot of this early legal work. And my next um, book, Becoming Bella, will further introduce these early years. So here I'm going to offer a teaser 
responding to a series of questions I received. Paul of Evanston, Illinois asked what was ABSEC's motivation to go to law school. Francesca of Detroit, Michigan asked how did ABSEC's cultural background shape her feminism. Suzanne of Detroit, Michigan asked who were, you know, who were ABSEC's mentors or people that influenced her activism and feminism. And finally, Jillian of Houston, Texas asked is there a story behind ABSEC's hats? Well, Bella Abzug began life as Bella Savitsky. She grew up in a Jewish enclave of the Bronx. She was born the year women got the vote. She liked to say she was born yelling, but actually in this section of the Bronx, she joined a yeller's choir because there were many political soapbox speakers who each had their ideas about how the United States should remake itself during the Great Depression. So Abzug listened to a lot of these speakers as she became one. Um, for her, she really found the answer first in religion. She was a very devout um, conservative Jew who taught Hebrew school and attended the Jewish theological seminaries, teacher's education program alongside her uh, time at Hunter College. I'm convinced that she would have been a rabbi instead of a lawyer if the opportunity was open to her. And here is an answer to the question about Abzug's cultural background shaping her feminism. Her Jewishness fired her commitment to social justice, but also sparked her early understanding of inst institutional sexism, hence the you know, desire to be the rabbi but not being able to, for only men did at that time. In her youth, Bella Abzug was also a hot Zionist, as she put it, and she was really preparing for a life on a kibbutz, a dream she never acted on. Um, in these days before Israel's founding, but definitely framed her political consciousness and specifically her class con consciousness, which, which she acquired as a labor Zionist scout in Hashemer Hatzair. Uh, and this really framed her decision to become a labor lawyer. She wanted to help workers defend themselves, and once practicing law, she extended her interest from labor law to civil rights and civil liberties. Bella Abzug also had a penchant for arguing with everyone from, from her father, who tragically died of a heart attack when she was in junior high, to other student government leaders when she was student body president at the all-woman, tuition-free Hunter College. This natural talent for debate and deliberation encouraged her toward a path in law, as did encouragement from her early role models. Key among them were her women professors in political science and law at Hunter College that really mentored her and nurtured her on. Also, her mother provided encouragement on two fronts. When Bella Abzug did not get into Harvard Law, a given because they did not admit women in these years, her mother urged her instead to ex accept a scholarship at Columbia Law School. It was only a short subway ride away, her mother reasoned. Her mother, Esther, also told her, a lady always wears a hat. And this really stuck with Bella Abzug um, through law school and into the legal profession. Law school taught Bella Abzug that the women's world she inhabited at home and at Hunter College were not the norm. Actually, it was a man's world. She was one of nine women in her class at Columbia Law, and she and others daily felt unwelcome on this camp campus when students and professors, and even the dean of the, college, of, the, um, of the law school, made it clear that, that women were admitted for the duration of World War II. But it was after law school when she entered courtrooms and the judges and opposing counsel still looked around for the lawyer they were waiting for when she, en when she would enter the room, and she decided she needed a prop to signal her entrance. So she began to wear hats, um, you know, every day to court to distinguish herself as a professional. She would make a display of taking off the hat, taking out her yellow legal pad, and making clear, I'm here and I'm not a secretary. This early experience in this male-dominated legal profession really provided the foundation for Abzug's um, understanding and interest in breaking up the boys club in Washington. She was attuned to how politics, like law, was a male space made by men. Just as she had been among a handful of women lawyers um, who practiced labor law work in the New York City area at the beginning of her career in the mid-1940s, she found herself as one of 15 women in Congress when she entered um, the House of Representatives in 1971. There was a lot of attention on Bella Abzug from the media because uh, she arrived 
as a radical, outspoken, and noticeable congresswoman, particularly because of her hats, but also because there were just so few women. Uh, it, they seem kind of like a novelty. So here I will turn to the question from Jacob of Houston, Texas. And, and um, Jacob asks, were there differences between Abzug's public persona and her private personality? So in my book, I focus more on analyzing Bella Abzug's political philosophy than deconstructing her personality and really trying to get into her head. Part of this is because historians don't really feel very comfortable with speculation. And um, a lot of the uh, sources that I was working with uh, were more of her congressional um, you know, files than any kind of personal papers. She, in fact, didn't really write very many personal letters or keep a journal. Um, and she really liked to say she was a doer and had longtime collaborators who were the writers, um, you know, the writer half of her, of her pair. And specifically one in, um, is important to note, and that is Mim Kelber, uh, who she met first in Walton High School and had a background in journalism. In fact, um, when they were both at Hunter College, uh, Mim Kelber wrote on the school newspaper. And then ultimately when she was in Congress, um, when Bella Abzug was in Congress, Mim Kelber was on staff helping round out her thoughts as a lead speechwriter and advisor. So what I was able to do um, to get into um, the understanding of how Ab Abzug um, compared on the personal side to her political persona was to interview a lot of friends, family members, work colleagues, and former staff. She also wrote an unfinished memoir that she left behind and um, did a number of oral histories with Columbia um, University. And also, in her first year in Congress, she sat down with a journalist uh, quite regularly uh, to basically um, put her reflections of her first experiences in Congress down to paper. And so the, their exchange became the book, Bella, Mrs. Abza Goes to Washington. So what I know, what I can tell you about Bella Abzug's um, personal and political, um, you know, differences is that uh, one thing that a lot of people saw was Bella Abzug, the performer. Uh, she blazed into a room and elevated it with her oratory. She was such a political celebrity that people would line up outside her office on Capitol Hill just for a glimpse and better yet, an autograph. She could turn on the charm and really had a great sense of humor but she also had what one staff member called an Abzugian temper. She could be demanding and unforgiving, but these, you know, the staff members that I have interviewed ha have been um, quick to say that she also was loyal and generous with her support. So she kind of had two, um, two sides to her as a boss. She was known on Capitol Hill to be a horrible boss, and there's a, a number of articles that kind of served as exposés of, of um, Bella Abzug, the boss. She could be really pushy with congressional colleagues as well. And I don't let Bella Abzug off the hook when talking about these qualities, but I do think it is important to consider why the Abzug treatment, which was akin to Lyndon B. Johnson's Johnson treatment, is not equally seen as a characteristic of leadership. One of the elements I explore in my book is how leadership is gendered and why Bella Abzug was held to a different standard than her male counterparts when her leadership style was judged. So privately, Bella Abzug dealt with two aspects of being in the political limelight that troubled her most. One was how her body image was picked apart in the press, which was very difficult for her. She often said, I used to be svelte. She would say um, this as she also talked about all the various diets that she was trying. And so she certainly ate when the pressure was on and when she was running in between activities. Second, she persistently faced political mudslinging and red baiting because of her radical politics. But also I would argue because, you know, um, there was still a lot of misogyny in politics too. She was scarred by her experience living through McCarthyism, a period where she represented clients who were executed, blacklisted, jailed, and she faced government surveillance herself. I want to provide this backdrop as a turn to the questions asked by Becca of New York City. Becca asked, what do you think are some of Bella Abzug's most important yet most under-recognized achievements? And Kelsey of Washington, D.C. asked, what do you wish more people knew about Bella Abzug or about this era of women in politics? Well, I believe 
Bella Abzug's civil liberties work in Congress is her most underappreciated and also was her most personally satisfying. In 1975, Bella Abzug chaired a subcommittee that was called the Government Information and Individual Rights Subcommittee. And this was part of the Gov Government Operations Committee. And this really was the moment that she was the most powerful. In fact, um, she was uh, named a whip at large in Congress um, in the House of Representatives. And so that was an, an acknowledgement of the, you know, the influence she had, especially within the progressive wing. So the Government Information and Individual Rights Subcommittee was a standing committee uh, that oversaw the record keeping practices of all agencies of the executive branch. This committee significantly schooled Americans on how to file Freedom of Information Act and Privacy Act requests when these laws were still in their infancy. Um, so FOIA and Privacy Act fell under the domain of um, the ABSA committee's oversight capacities. And we today really see these as fundamental democratic tools, but really people didn't know how to use them um, in this early period. The ABSA committee also provided Bella Abzug with a vehicle to, in her words, harass back. So what do I mean by this? Well, on a personal level, she sought retribution for the years she and her clients had been under surveillance. And on a political level, she participated in, Congress in a Congress-wide uh, reevaluation of the national security state and executive powers in the aftermath of the Watergate scandal. The question at hand was, had the covert activities of U.S. intelligence agencies um, and the stamp of executive privilege gone too far? Abzug believed yes. Drawing, she really did drew focus in showy hearings to how thousands of Americans, including herself, had been under surveillance by organizations and uh, agencies such as the FBI and CIA as early as the 1950s. But more than theatrics, um, her committee really uh, focused in on the day-to-day -day nut nuts and bolts of oversight, writing lengthy reports and drafting legislation that reinforced Americans' right to know. And the result was helping bring greater transparency to government. I definitely wish more people knew about this work, and I think the absence of attention to Abzug's broad policy interests, such as in her er this area of civil liberties, really reflects how women in politics are pigeonholed as caring only about women's issues or the interests of women and children. So I want to just briefly uh, turn, return focus to uh, just a broader um, you know, view of Bella Abzug as, an in, as a progressive who is very focused on intersectional politics um, or the interconnections between race, class, and gender. Anne of Boston, Massachusetts asked me, how did protest um, figure into Bella's political career and did her use of protests and grassroots organizing tactics impact other DC politicians? Likewise, Maddie of Chicago, Illinois asked, you know, can you tell me more about Abzug's progressivism? How is it different from what we consider progressive positions today? Well, Abzug really was an outsider working on the inside. Um, seeking to uproot, you know, what was seen as the system uh, from within. And she ran as a new politics Democrat, a change candidate focused on bringing new priorities to Washington, most important to her being the end of the Vietnam War. So I would say that peace, more so than women's rights, was a driver for her politics and her determination to run, um, you know, for Congress in the first place uh, in 1970. So moving my story beyond Bella Abzug, I draw focus uh, in my book to this new politics moment in which progressives coming out of the 1960s social movements gave the Democratic Party establishment a run for their money. And this establishment was largely Cold War liberals and Southern Democrats. While they didn't forge an entire takeover of the Democratic Party, I think a lot of the policies that are passed in these years really demonstrate the imprint of new politics, as well as the internal reforms that change the face and, um, and the um, focus of the Democratic Party going forward. So what I think is important to highlight is Bella Abzug was not a singular force, though she was very forceful. She was part of a new politics movement that brought protest energy to electoral politics, and she and others provided progressive social movement organizers with the resources of and the access to Capitol Hill. There are strong parallels 
remarkably strong parallels between this moment and that one, between Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and you know this new kind of wing of the Democratic Party, this rebirth of progressivism, and the new politics insurgency of the late 1960s and the mid to the mid 1970s. And a lot of the political goals Bella Abzug pushed for um, really to limited effect in this earlier period are starting to gain a lot of traction, such as a green economy, universal child care, affordable higher, higher education, and LGBT rights. Um, and so these are the centerpiece concerns, I would say, among many others, um, you know, women's rights, economic justice, uh, just to name a few others, um, that also were important to Bella Abzug. But basically we can see um, this continuation of a political tradition uh, of progressivism um, that is coming from the left wing of the Democratic Party um, then and today, and today. So next I want to turn to the excellent questions um, offered by Rhea of S Seattle, Washington. She um, asked, how do you think uh, Abzug's legacy lives on in the politics we are ex experiencing today? And Sammy of New York, New York asked, what advice do you have for young women wanting to get uh, involved with local politics? Well, I kind of started to answer um, the first of those two questions already, but I want to draw focus also to um, this idea of uh, looking to our past for role models for today. And I think Bella Abzug is a worthy candidate. And in fact, her daughter, Liz Abzug, uh, runs today the Bella Abzug Leadership Institute at Hunter College. And this really reflects um, her mother's as well as her own uh, belief that it is important to cult cultivate young women's leadership skills and to encourage them forward as leaders in their communities. Bella Abzug was frustrated when she got started in politics that their, the party patronage system did not invest in women through mentorship or financially uh, in their campaigns. And really this was because it was assumed that women could and would not be winners in the ballot box. So this is why um, Bella Abzug helped found the National Women's Political Caucus of, 19, uh, of 1971. But even before that, for a decade or so, she had been advocating within the peace movement and then the anti-Vietnam War movement um, to bring more women into decision-making positions. So Bella Abzug uh, was pleased when other groups came to um, the foreground, such as Emily's List and the White House Project. These were in her time. Um, and you know, the pragmatist in her, and she was definitely a pragmatist, um, would encourage political hopefuls to build a following. Um, so this would be her advice for today, to build a following, to have a clear principled message, and to be crafty in messaging. So just as an example, when Bella Abzug introduced herself as a political unknown uh, in 1970, uh, when she was campaigning, she wore buttons that said, hello, I'm Bella Abzug, and absolutely. So when she was asked by constituents at subway stops, who are you? She'd point to her Hello, I'm Bella Abzug um, button, uh, or basically show that that was already answered. And when she constantly was asked, do you think you can win? All she had to do was point to her buttons and they had their answers. Last, I turn to a question I've been asked recently, posed by Jackie of Beaumont, Texas which is, have you seen the TV show Mrs. America about the ERA and what do you think? And the answer is yes, I'm watching along with a lot of other Americans, a lot of other historians, and a group of historians um, who have expertise in this area are reporting in real time our thoughts on the show. So if you're interested, follow hashtag Mrs. A History. And also I'm planning to write a review of the Bella Abzug episode, Bella episode um, when it airs in mid-May, so stay tuned for that. And so I'll hold my answer, my judgment on the show until then. So sorry, Jackie, but thanks to you and to all of you who uh, sent in your questions. I hope that my answers have encouraged you to learn even more about the political trailblazer, Bella Abzug, who I'm thrilled is being discovered once again. Thank you.